Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about the 2000 Houston Bowl between Texas Tech and East Carolina, and how a bizarre lie with regards to the number of tickets sold destroyed the Bulls' credibility forever. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And join me tomorrow night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern, where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes. Link to play below. And now, on with our feature presentation. When a coach is thinking about resigning in the middle of a season, it's usually for one of a few reasons. Sometimes, it's because they know that the writing is on the wall, and that they're going to be fired at the end of the season, so it's in the best interest of everyone if the coach and the team just went their separate ways before the end of the season so as not to cause a giant distraction. Sometimes, it's because they're given an ultimatum from the front office. Step down, or we'll fire you and they opt to step down to leave with grace. Sometimes, it's for medical purposes, as they're advised by a doctor that they can't keep doing this, because the heavy workload and lifestyle of a coach is too much for them to handle at this stage in their life. However, whatever the case is, these resignations usually come later on in the season. If a coach is resigning in the middle of the season, especially for a non-medical reason, it's usually sometime around December. It's not after, you know, the very first game of the season. It's not because they're so distraught after losing on opening day that they decide to walk away. Or at the very least, think about it. Well, this is Kansas City Chiefs head coach Gunther Cunningham. The Chiefs had some great coaches around the turn of the decade, with the 1990s featuring the legendary Marty Schottenheimer, and the early 2000s featuring the Hall of Famer Dick Vermeil. But sandwiched in between the two men was this guy right here, Gunther Cunningham. And while he was not a good coach by any means, perhaps his biggest and most infamous claim to fame might be what happened in 2000, when following a loss on opening day to the Indianapolis Colts, he was on the brink of resigning. Hanging it up and quitting on your team after just one game in a 16-game season. As crazy and as ridiculous as that sounds, that's what Cunningham was about to do. And this is the story behind one of the craziest and most bizarre coaching dramas in the over 60-year history of the Kansas City Chiefs franchise. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context to understand just who Gunther Cunningham was, how everything was going with him, and how the game against the Colts went, to the point where Cunningham thought about walking away right then and there. Our story begins in 1999 when following the resignation of Marty Schottenheimer, the Chiefs promoted defensive coordinator Gunther Cunningham to the position of head coach. Cunningham had been the team's defensive coordinator for the past four seasons, so he knew the team and the personnel incredibly well. And in two of his four seasons as the team's defensive coordinator, the Chiefs allowed the fewest points in the NFL, as the Chiefs were two years removed from a 1997 season where they allowed just 14.5 points per game, the best total in the league. On paper, Cunningham seemed like the safe and logical choice to take the Chiefs forward after a decade of Schottenheimer at the wheel, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, in 1999, Cunningham did not have the best of seasons. Even though the Chiefs started 5-2 and, and seemed like they were on cruise control to make it to the postseason, as they had done for much of the 1990s, they collapsed heavily down the stretch, finishing with a 9-7 record after two straight losses to the Seattle Seahawks and Oakland Raiders in overtime to end their playoff hopes, and to end their season on an incredibly sour note. It also didn't help that Cunningham's decision to sign kicker John Baker, who single-handedly cost the Chiefs the game against the Raiders by having not one, not two, but three kickoffs go out of bounds, backfired in rather spectacular fashion. But entering 2000, it was a brand new year, and Cunningham even though he was feeling a ton of pressure from the media and the fan base, and even though his seat was already hot after this choke job, was ready to forget about what happened to close out the 1990s, and was ready to move forward into the 2000s. The first game of the brand new season? That would be against the reigning AFC East champion Indianapolis Colts. No easy feat. But before I talk about the game, we have to talk about what happened to Kansas City during the offseason and the tragedy that took place that played a significant part in this story. This man right here is Derek Thomas, and for over a decade, he was an anchor on Kansas City's defense, even holding the single-game record 
when in week 10 of the 1990 season against the Seattle Seahawks, he recorded seven sacks. He was a nine-time Pro Bowler, a member of the All-1990s team, was a three-time first-team All-Pro, and a three-time second-team All-Pro. By all accounts, Thomas was one of the best linebackers to ever play the sport, and might have been the greatest defender in the history of the Kansas City Chiefs. But on January 23, 2000, at the age of 33, Thomas's life would be cut way too short, when he was driving during a snowstorm and drove off the interstate. Thomas was paralyzed from the accident, and two weeks later, would die with a blood clot stemming from the injury. The Chiefs were going to dedicate this entire 2000 season, and especially this opening game, to Thomas to honor his legacy. If the Chiefs could win this opening game against the Colts, and do it for Derek Thomas, then that would be amazing. Every day, Cunningham looked at a photo of Thomas, and whispered to it, speaking to him and saying, We're going to win for you. This game against the Colts was more than just a regular season game for Cunningham. This was a chance to honor the legacy of one of the greatest icons in franchise history. As for how this game turned out, well, the Chiefs did not play well. Not at all. Because when the final whistle sounded, it was the Indianapolis Colts who came out on top, taking it over the Chiefs by a final score of 27-14, with the Colts outscoring the Chiefs 13-0 over the final quarter of the game. The Chiefs started the game off poorly, punting on their first four drives, and they ended the game poorly, going scoreless on their final four drives with two punts, one interception, and a turnover on downs. The Colts dominated with time of possession, holding onto the ball for over 33 minutes, and they did a great job on third down, going 6 for 13, converting on over 46% of their attempts. Compare that to the Chiefs, who went just 5 for 16 across third and fourth down combined, and it's not hard to see who had the edge there. The Chiefs got nothing going on the ground, picking up just 74 rushing yards on barely 3 yards per carry. And they got nothing going through the air, with Elvis Gerback only going 16 for 37, completing a mere 43.2% of his passes. And his receivers didn't help him out at all either, dropping 6 passes on the day. The Colts had 106 more yards than the Chiefs did, and just played a better game overall, especially in the second half and this loss left Gunther Cunningham absolutely distraught. I don't mean that he was upset in the sense that a coach is usually upset after a loss. He was spiraling. He wanted to win this game so badly for Derek Thomas, and instead, they lose by 13. So what does Cunningham decide to do after the game? He decides to announce to the team that he's retiring. And let's just say that if this story wasn't a bit unusual anyways, it's about to get really bizarre. So buckle up and hang on tight. That Sunday night, after the game, Cunningham was thinking about walking away from the team and handing the reins over to someone else. He was talking with his wife, Renee, for hours upon hours that night in their living room. As Gunther said to his wife, Renee, I can't get it done for them. When his wife tried encouraging him and tried making him believe in himself and his coaching abilities, Gunther reiterated that he just couldn't do it, saying, No, I can't. Gunther was dead set on quitting the team, to the point where the conversation went until 1 o'clock in the morning. Even his son Adam chimed in and thought that his father was being absolutely ridiculous, saying, You're not a quitter. Come on. What are you talking about? Keep in mind... Gunther was set to report to the facility at 3 a.m., so he got no sleep that night. The entire night was just an endless cycle of talk involving his future as the head coach with the Chiefs, and whether or not he should walk away after one loss. Now, there are some reports that say this conversation never happened in his house, and instead took place in his office over a four-hour period. But regardless, the base story remains the same. Gunther was thinking about resigning, and his wife Renee convinced him to not do that. Alright, so we have a coach that's thinking about quitting after one game. Seems rather odd. But what was even odder is that when the team arrived in the locker room the next day, Cunningham told his players this. You know that time I was probably going to spend last night reviewing tape from this past game so we can fix what went wrong? I was probably going to spend looking at tape for our next opponent so we can get ready for them? Yeah, I wasn't doing that. I was spending that time panicking and thinking about quitting you guys after one game, leaving you hung out to dry. Whoops, 
My bad. And this is where an already weird story gets even weirder. Because it would be one thing if Cunningham tried to deny this, and it was just a battle of he said, she said between Cunningham and reporters with inside sources. And as was to be expected, Cunningham denied any of this taking place. During a press conference afterwards in the wake of this report, he said, quite bluntly, I'm not planning to resign. Whatever I said with the team is between me and the team, and that's how it's going to stay. No, I did not contemplate resigning. That's the biggest joke I've ever seen. Do I look like I'm going to resign? And general manager Carl Peterson backed up his coach, saying that Cunningham was never going to resign. As Peterson said, Gunther Cunningham is probably one of the toughest-minded individuals I've ever been involved with in coaching. The statement that he was seriously contemplating stepping away is ludicrous. This guy's essence is coaching football. It's what he lives to do and lives every minute for, and he's done an excellent job. But what makes this all the more bizarre is that this didn't become a battle between Cunningham and the press. This became a battle between Cunningham and his players. Because his players were saying in their press conferences, Yeah, our coach told us that he was going to resign. So it wasn't the coach against the media. It was the coach against his own players. Wide receiver Kevin Lockett said on Cunningham's comments in the locker room, It was a little shocking to hear that. He's somewhat frustrated because he knows how good we can be. He's been in this profession for 30 years, and he sees the only reason we're not doing well is we're not reaching our full potential. And the general theme amongst the players was that Cunningham was not taking the loss well. But they didn't buy his retirement for one second. As guard Donald Willis said, I don't think anybody really took it seriously. And as Dante Hall said, you have those thoughts, but they come and go. That's how you think after a big loss. Other players agree that this was probably just a really bad attempt at motivation that was poorly thought out. With one of the rookies echoing that thought, and another player saying that Cunningham was emotional. So just to recap where we are, you have a coach that was on the brink of resigning, but got talked out of it at the 11th hour by his wife, then told the team he was thinking about resigning, then the team told the press what Cunningham said, but Cunningham denied ever saying that, and criticized all those who thought he was resigning, even though the players said that he literally said that, but the players didn't believe it a whole lot because they thought it was a motivational tactic, while the coach was so distraught that in actuality, even if he wouldn't admit it, he was thinking about hanging it up after one game. Got all that? If you can follow that story and that weird web, congratulations, because that was a mouthful to say the least. But there are so many things baffling about what Cunningham tried to do here. Mainly, why would you ever admit that you were thinking about resigning after the first game? How does this help you at all? If you're trying to motivate your guys, Congratulations! You failed. Any player that doesn't like you is now actively hoping that you resign. And any player that had your back is thinking that you're either a quitter, and we shouldn't rally around you because you're going to leave at any moment when the going gets tough, or they think that you're bluffing and aren't serious, which means you lost credibility. Because how can we trust anything that you say and any instructions that you give when you go on and make a statement like that? Plus, you just admitted to the world that you make decisions based on emotions and not rational thinking, which seems like the last thing you want a leader to be doing. It seemed like Cunningham was genuinely going to resign, and then, when he decided not to thanks to his wife, tried to downplay the whole incident in front of his players, but did so in the worst way possible. And after a 7-9 record, it's really not hard to see why the Chiefs fired Cunningham after just two seasons. That one moment basically torpedoed his entire career. It would be incredibly tough to picture Doug Peterson walking away from the Jaguars after their Week 1 game against the Washington Commanders. It would be incredibly tough to picture Kevin Stefanski walking away from the Browns after their Week 1 game against the Carolina Panthers. But in 2000, this bizarre scenario was legitimately moments away, and perhaps one line of dialogue from Renee Cunningham away, from happening. Because of all the coaches that the Chiefs have had throughout the years, from the very good to the very bad and everything in between, I can't say that a coach pulled off this stunt before. Because in 2000, literally one game was all it took to completely break their head coach's spirits. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. 
And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.